Bibles this morning to any place, I told you, because it's all good. But I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus, chapter 17. You can turn that down just a titch. Just. My message this morning is t entitled, Are You a Her? H-U-R. Not a him, and not a her, H-E-R, but are you a her? H-U-R. Exodus chapter 17, let's all stand up please for the reading of God's word. We're going to start with verse 8 and then we're going to go right through to verse 16. Beginning with verse number 8, the Bible says, Then Amalek, uh, then came Amalek and fought with Israel at Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek tomorrow, and I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. That rod of God, of course, was the staff that uh, Moses, uh, remember, turned into a snake. So he always had that. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And consequently, Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. Joshua was the successor uh, to, of the leader of Moses, and he was also the general over Israel's armies. He was the one that took over after Moses died on, on um, Mount Hob. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. That means the Lord our banner. You know, when the armies, uh, even today when they go into battle, Roman legions, they always have a banner. Well, he's Jehovah Nissi. He's the Lord our banner. Amen. Verse number 16, for he said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Boy, you don't want to be an Amalekite, amen, and have the Lord against you as your enemy. Let's go to the throne of grace. Holy Father, we praise you this morning as we stand in thy presence in the sanctuary. And Lord of God, I pray that you'd anoint this message. You'd give this preacher a physical strength, a spiritual anointing, Lord God, and the Holy Spirit of the living God would move in the hearts of thy people those watching by television, YouTube, here today, Lord God, and you'd help them grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask it all in the Christ's name, with mercy and thanksgiving through faith, and you may be seated. So the question people normally ask was, who in the world was Amalek? That's a good question. Well, the Amalekites, beloved, they were a nomadic and desert people, and they were Israel's avowed enemies. In fact, the Bible teaches that they were the descendants of Esau, who was Jacob's twin brother, of course. Now, after Jacob wrestled with God, his name and nature was supernaturally changed to Israel. That word Israel means one who prevails with God, but ultimately it is one who is ruled by God. So the name Israel is one that prevails with God, and it's one who is what? Ruled by God. Just like Jacob, his nature was changed, his name was changed, his soul was changed. Why? Because the Spirit of God had now circumcised his heart. Would you say amen out there? So henceforth, beloved, there was enmity constantly between the descendants of Esau, and who were the Amalekites, and the descendants of Jacob. And Jacob now, of course, is a saved man, and through him, the children of Israel came. Now when God revealed, or delivered, I should say, the nation of Israel out of their 400 years of Egyptian captivity, the Amalekites then waged war against the cherry, uh, children of Israel in a series of savage, and I mean savage, surprise attacks, beloved, at their rear column where all of the most vulnerable people were. So you can see all these stragglers kind of straggling behind and the Amalekites ruthlessly and they viciously attacked all these defenseless hindmost people, beloved, who lagged and trailed behind because they could not keep up with the fast pace of the rest of the people. So, beloved, you know when you're, everybody else is kind of moving along there and you're just kind of straggling, that was what's happening. And so the Amalekites said, you know what, we're going to wipe them out and we're going to work our way up to the top until we utterly and totally decimate the children of Israel. 
So you can see why they were God's enemies, amen? Anyways, beloved, they took advantage of this merciless uh, situation, and they attacked the rearmost. And ultimately, their goal was, we're going to just blot out the name of the children of Israel forever. So what did they do? So they attacked the, stra- the slowpokes, the weak, the sick, the sick and firm. They, they attacked the elderly. They attacked the disabled, those who couldn't move along very well. And they were killing them one by one, beloved. And these were warriors. They were armed to the teeth. And so these people didn't have a chance. They were killing the young children. They couldn't keep up with their parents, and they were knocking them off. But I want to tell you something, beloved. Consequently, they became God's avowed enemies. And God said, because you're my avowed enemies, and these are my people, I'm going to have them ultimately wipe you out. So you don't want to become an enemy of God. Amen? So this was holy war. This was holy jihad, so to speak. And so, beloved, later... We know from Scripture that King Saul, the first king in Israel, he would attack the Amalekites, trying to wipe them out. He couldn't do it. King David came along with repeated attacks against the Amalekites, and he couldn't do it. But ultimately, in the days of Queen uh, Esther, when uh, remember when uh, Haman, when he uh, gave this death decree to kill all of the children of Israel, well, Haman was an Amalekite. But that night, beloved, God moved on King Ahasuerus, or King Xerxes, and he issued a counter-decree. Now, the Persians, when they would make a decree, you couldn't change it. It was irrevocable. And so they were going to wipe out. Haman deceived King Ahasuerus. But what, what, uh, through Queen Esther and, of course, the providential hand of God, he issued a counter-decree, and they killed all the rest of the Amalekites. So from that time forth... The Amalekites, that branch of Esau's descendants, ceased to exist anymore. And so that kind of freed up the children of Israel. So you know, beloved, up until this point, juncture in time, Israel leaves uh, Egypt after 400 years of captivity. Ultimately, God had fought all their battles for them. In fact, Moses said, stand still and see the deliverance of thy God. They didn't have to fight. The Egyptians, they chase them across the Jordan River. What does God do? He drowns them all. So God was fighting for Israel. But now, he says, regarding the Amalekites, now you're going to have to learn to fight. And they had to learn to fight, beloved, because they had to conquer the land of Canaan. And so they were going up against real strong armed people in the land of Canaan. There were seven nations there. I don't have time to go into it. But that God said, I want you to totally wipe those people off the map. They're idolatrous, they're perverted, uh, they're, they're uh, just uh, uh, abomination, they're morally and spiritually corrupt in my sight, wipe them off the map. Ultimately, they didn't do that. But anyways, beloved, Israel now is going to have to learn to fight for themselves, and fighting the Amalekites was their kind of introduction into what they were going to do. I want you to look at verses uh, 8 through 10a again, if you would. In Exodus chapter 17, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said unto him and fought with Amalek. Now, beloved, Rephidim, what in the world are we talking about? Rephidim was right near to Mount Sinai. And, beloved, it was the place where God spoke to Moses there, and he told Moses, I want you to speak to the rock, and I want you to bring water supernaturally out of that rock. So this is familiar territory to the children of Israel, remember, because they were so disobedient, they had gone around that mountain for 40 years. Probably The road was probably six feet deep by that time. God says, and it was only an 11-day trip, by the way. They could have gone from from, uh, Egypt into the land of Canaan in 11 days. But it took them 40 years because of their disobedience to God. But anyways, beloved, this is where the battle was enjoined. This is where the Amalekites and the children of Israel were going to fight. So Moses now sent General Joshua with a contingent of commandos. These were special forces. These were people that were highly trained warriors and soldiers, beloved. And he says, I want you to take them, and I want you to engage, and I want you to fight against the Amalekites. 
And he said, Joshua, I want you to know this. When you're doing that, I'm going to take the rod of God, I'm going to stand atop of that hill, and I'm going to raise it up before God, and I am going to intercede before God that God would put his hand upon our soldiers, that our soldiers would prevail in the battle. Would you say amen out there? My beloved, you know, holding up your hand, I used to say to my, my, my uh, students when I taught the martial arts, I want you to hold your hand up. And you, you think it's simple, right? But after one or two minutes, your gravity's pulling on your arms. <laughs> your hands, they, they get as heavy as elephants, don't they? They want to just drop right down. This was going to be an all-day battle. Moses, take the rod of God, put it up over your head and hold it there and intercede and pray before God so God will defeat the children of Israel. You know, it's hard even for a young man to hold his hand up over his head very long, let alone Moses, who's now over 80 years of age, probably around 83. Probably about 83 years of age at that time. Well, as the battle began, beloved, that morning, Moses raised the staff up over his head to God. And consequently, Israel started prevailing in the battle. They started overcoming. Even though they were outnumbered, they began overcoming the Amalekites. But as the battle waged into a protracted, long-day battle, a long fight, beloved, Moses got exhausted. And he would take the rod of God. You know, when you're holding it up like this, you get tired. You switch it to your other hand, you get tired. Then you're doing it with both hands, and they're getting tired. So he's going back and forth, back and forth. As Moses would get tired and drop his hand down, what would happen was the Amalekites now would prevail. So Moses, taking all the strength he had, he'd take it up, put it over his head, then the Israelites would prevail. God's teaching us something there about intercessory prayer, by the way. You don't pray, stop praying because you get a little tired. You pray through. Would you say amen out there? You pray on through to victory. Pray on through until you get what you want. Jesus said, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth. And he that knocketh it shall be opened. Come on and say amen out there. So anyways, beloved, Moses' hand starts getting a little tired. He's switching them back and forth. You can see it. And so he's saying, what am I going to do? But you know, Moses was a wise old man. The Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, or give it to all men liberally and upbraid it not. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think he will receive anything from the Lord, for a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. That's James 1, 2 through 8. So if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. God is our divine wisdom. So God downloads this wisdom into Moses. And Moses comes up with a contingency contingency plan. That's the word I'm looking for. I want you to look at verse 10b now, right through to verse 13. It says that Moses and Aaron and Ur went up to the top of the hill, and it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone, and they put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Ur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Notice how long this battle was. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people, he says, with the edge of the sword. So what was Moses' contingency plan? Moses must have thought, you know what? I'm an old timer right now, and I'm going to bring a couple of people up the top of that hill with me just in case I get tired, they can help me. So he chooses Aaron, his brother. Aaron, ladies and gentlemen, was the high priest in Israel, and he typifies the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our great high priest in the heavenly sanctuary right now interceding for us. Amen? So he chooses him, but also he chooses an unknown man. And this unknown man, his name is Ur, H-U-R, whose name means light, and that typifies the Holy Spirit. Beloved, Aaron and Hur stood by the side, uh, side of uh, Moses and they helped hold up his arms to ensure that Israel would win a great victory over Amalek. Now this incident, this picture of the Old Testament church graphically portrays a profound principle that is also needed in the New Testament church. Now listen to me, that is no one can do God's work all by himself. He needs the Holy Spirit. He needs the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? He needs other people to do it. No one can do it all by himself, no matter how anointed they are, no matter how talented they are. 
No matter how gifted they are, you can only do God's work, beloved, with the help of others and uh, that God is also called to put around us. When God called me to uh, start TCM, God also called other people and he put them around me to help me to be able to do what he wanted me to do. And by their doing what they're doing, God's going to reward them as much as he rewarded me. Praise the Lord. Amen. So we don't ever have to worry about competition or does this person getting more recognition than we don't have to worry about that. And I'll talk a little about, about that as we go along. But you see, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this. It takes a combined effort to win in the spiritual battle. We all have a job to do and must lend a hand to help the church of God. Now listen to me. The church is the body of Christ. Do you get that? The bride of Christ. If you don't love the body and the bride, you do not love Christ, whom you can't see. If you can't love who you can see, then you can't love him who you can't see. It says in 1 John chapter 3. The church is the visible portion of the invisible kingdom of God on this earth. The kingdom of God spreads throughout the earth, but how do you know where it is? You look for the, you find the church. Amen. That's the visible portion of the kingdom of God on this earth. But you see, beloved, we need to all of us pitch in. We need to hold up the hands of our spiritual leaders. I don't mean just me. I'm not talking about, pretend I'm not even here talking to you. Well, we need to hold up the hands of the spiritual leaders, beloved. You listen to me. They're at the very tip of the spear, and Satan always wants to silence them. Always. And he'll do everything physically, spiritually, monitor everything, financially, whatever he can to get them to quit, hang up their, their uh, cleats. You know, most men my age, they, most preachers retire at 60 because of the weight of the ministry. I'm a little older than that. But through the grace of God, he's given me the strength to continue, and he's given me a, a fire in my belly that I want to keep on preaching until the day that I drop. I hope it's not today. But we need to be able to hold up the hands of our spiritual leaders and our fellow Christians uh, to overcome in the spiritual battle. Listen to me, beloved. Where in the world would you be without leaders? Can you imagine an army without leaders? A leader who knows the topography, the logistics of everything. Like, where would you be without leaders? See, God is the one who set the organizations in place, not us. And everybody wants to be a leader, but most people can't be a leader. You know why? They can't take the heat once they're in the seat. Everybody likes you when you're out there. When you get here and have to make decisions that people don't like, then a lot of people say, that's it. You know, how can they say that to me? I was their friend. Boo -hoo -hoo -hoo. Boo -hoo -hoo -hoo. You know, you, got right. you need to have rhino hide. Amen? But each of us need to shoulder some of the responsibility. How? By serving. How? By helping. How? By encouraging and edifying our spiritual leaders and the church, beloved. The stone that Moses sat on, that Aaron and Hur pushed him down on, typifies the Lord Jesus Christ. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying he is the spiritual rock that followed the nation of Israel, it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. And also, he's the spiritual rock of the New Testament, Israel, the church. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, he's a, uh, the chief cornerstone of the church. He is the foundation stone of the church. Listen to me now. Our victory in the spiritual battle only comes by us sitting on that divine and supernatural stone. It only comes by relying on that stone. You sit down like you're, like, like you're glued to the seat. And by trusting in him and depending on him, that's the only way you're going to be victorious in the spiritual battle. Well, ever listen to me. We never get successful in the spiritual battle in and of ourselves. You know, I've seen a lot of things over my tenure as a pastor and as, a, as I've gotten older in life. And a person that can be checked out by the doctors today, tomorrow can drop dead of a heart attack. You never know, Amen. People who have held robust health all their life, all of a sudden overnight, come down with some serious, of course all diseases pathological takes years, but finally it manifests itself and, and that's the way it is. So we need to make sure, beloved, that we're depending on this stone and we're encouraging and trying to hold up the hands of our fellow Christians and our spiritual leaders, amen? But you know, beloved, this is what amazes me. Jesus said this, without me, you can do nothing. But Paul said, 
through Christ I can do all things uh, uh, which strengthen, who strengthens me, right? We can't do it all on our own. We think He can, but it's God that gives us the breath. It's God that makes our heart beat. It's God who gives us the strength. It's God who gives us the opportunity to serve. And it's God who puts the other people around us. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, Moses goes up to the top of the mountain, but who is this unknown man named Ur? I mean, as you study the scriptures, you see that he suddenly steps out of nowhere, beloved, into the scene to do a great work for God in Israel. But when his job is done, then he just steps right out into the, of the limelight and he back into the shadows from which he came. God had him there for a purpose. He came out, did his purpose, and then he turns around and he's gone. Now, beloved people, listen to me now, have looked to Moses and Aaron as the real leaders and heroes of faith in this story. But me thinks they're wrong. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying the real hero in this story is the unknown man named Ur. Why is that, Pastor Joel? Please tell me. I want to know. Because, beloved, he represents all of the unknown. He represents all the unrecognized people in the church who work behind the scenes and do the seemingly menial jobs to help and ensure that the leaders can now dedicate and devote themselves to doing their jobs. And I'm saying that without the help of Aaron and her beloved, Moses could have never done his job and ensured Israel's victory. Amen? You see, folks, Aaron and her had to help hold up Moses' arm so he could continue in, pray, in prayer. And, and beloved, you know... There's some people that have been given the gift of prayer that, and faith that they believe so much that when they pray, God answers their prayer. And when we have those kind of people in the sanctuary, you want them praying for you, amen? Now, God hears all prayers, but there's some people that he's especially gifted, and he says, I want them. They're the real intercessors right here. Let them pray for you. And that means you've got to humble yourself, doesn't it? you got to go to them and say, listen, brother, listen, sister, listen, pastor, would you pray for me? This is my problem. Would you pray for me? Get God involved in my life. So, beloved, Moses says, I can't hold up that rod of God over my head. I can't do it. I can't do it on my own. I can only do it if Aaron and her are there to help me. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying he typifies all the unknowns in the church who step up to the plate who volunteer and help to do those menial, albeit necessary jobs when they see the need and the opportunity arises to serve God, and they do it normally without asking. I've had people come up to me, Pastor Joel, do you want me to do this? I saw that when I came in, this, and I said, God bless you, my brother. I said, would you do it for me? In fact, beloved, when I picked my, when I picked my de deacons when we started the church, you know what I did? I purposely went around. So the word deacon means diakonos. It means a servant. They don't have any authority but they serve the pastor. You know what I do? I walk into church purposely and I drop paper on the floor. You know why I did that? I wanted to see who would pick it up. Why is that? Because I needed to pick some deacons who had a servant's heart. When the church service ends normally here, beloved, you know what I do? I go around and I pick up whatever I see on the floor. And that's why you've lost your wallet. And that's why you don't have your credit cards. <laughs> You see, beloved, we're all servants to God. Amen. You listen to me, beloved, what I'm saying to you. These are the type of people that have a heart for the Lord and the kingdom of God, and they want to see it succeed. And these people, beloved, have a heart to help the church and the leaders and all the various ministries, beloved. There is no victory in the church, none. No strength in the church, no success in the church without those errors working behind the scenes. None whatsoever. So therefore, beloved, we need to pray or pay tribute to the errors in the church, the people who go unnoticed, the people who go unthanked and unappreciated, the people that go unseen, who work behind the scenes, beloved. And what they end up doing is performing the jobs that are so desperately needed and vital to the church, beloved, so it can effectively function. Down at the, when we were at the uh, Camelot Park, uh, I used to go there when it was snow, and I, I started shoveling to keep the, so we could have... The owners of the park were, were friends of mine, and they plow everything out, and then we start shoveling. And then the next thing I knew, then a few, next couple of storms, I started having other people. They said, well, gee, if the pastor can do it, we can go and do it. And, of course, I always had my son. I made him, <laughs> I made him do it. 
But you see, beloved, we're all servants, aren't we? Nothing's too menial for God. Nothing. You, I've told you before, my doors, beloved, without that little hinge, that big door could not work. That hinge is critical to the functioning of the door. Am I right? You can have the best car out there, but if you don't have that little key, that, that key is what's going to make that big car of yours function. God says, despise not the day of small things. That's what God says. Don't despise the day of small things. If you've been called to do a small thing for God, then do it. And he sees it. God sees it. Would you say amen out there? So I'm saying these folks, these are the folks who don't get the recognition they deserve. These are the folks, beloved, who do what needs to be done, even though others think it's too menial for them to do. And I can assure you that these are the folks that truly keep the ministry going. Now, I want to share with you three characteristics of these special people who are indeed the true errs and heroes in the church. Three characters. I could have given you five. I had six, but I said I'm just going to keep it to three. The first thing, beloved, people uh, like Ur are absolutely, now listen to me, invaluable. People like Ur are absolutely invaluable. I want you to look at verse number 12 in Exodus chapter 17. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Ur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Now here's Moses atop that mountain. He's trying, trying the best he can. You can look at Moses, beloved. He's an older man right now, and he's struggling to keep his arms up. He wants to ensure that Israel has been divinely enabled to be able to conquer the Amalekites. To drop his hands out of sheer exhaustion meant, beloved, certain defeat for the nation of Israel. Have you ever had to hold on to someone? I can remember in the service, I had to hold on to someone. We were over a precipice. And I held on, and I held on to my... I said, I said if you go, I'm going. You, 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 and we just... And then we were just utterly, just totally, completely exhausted. He said, you've got to go do your own mission. I said, you are my mission. And you hold on, and you hold on, and you hold on. You don't quit unless you drop dead. And your arm may come out of joint, and your elbow may come out of joint, but you hold on. Would you say amen out there? But Aaron and her, as they're there with Moses, they see what's happening, beloved. They see what needed to be done. And so, uh, to make the difference between Israel's victory and defeat, what did they do without being asked, without great fanfare, beloved, without any accolades or honors? They just stepped up to the plate. They just stepped forward, beloved. And they did what had to be done without ever anybody saying, would you help me, please? You see, that shows something about a person's heart, doesn't it? Where their heart is. A lot of people expect everybody to minister to them, but they don't want to minister to anyone else. I want to come in and suck up all the knowledge I can from you, Pastor Joel, but I'm just going to live afterwards. You don't need to be ministered to. I do. I'm a human being. I'm a fallible human being like the rest of you. Trying to do what the Lord has called me to do. You see, beloved, they did a job that wasn't very exciting or glorious, right? And they did a job that wasn't very noticeable, beloved. So when they saw Moses, the man of God, getting tired and struggling, trying to hold up the rod of God, so General Joshua could lead Israel's army, the people of God, on the victory. They immediately stepped in, one on one side, one on the other. Don't worry, Moses, we're here with you to the end. Semper Fi, Semper Fidelis, the Marine Corps motto, always faithful. Come on and say amen out there. Yeah, praise the Lord, hoorah. That's what the Marine would usually say when you say Semper Fi, you say hoorah. <laughs> okay. Beloved, and notice they stayed up his hands not only throughout the day, but it says in the text that all the way through until the sun set and went down. You know, the Apostle Paul said this in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. He said, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now that's an interesting word, bear ye. It's the Greek word bestadzo. And it means to take up with the hands, to uphold, sustain, support, carry it through until the job was done. In other words, beloved, what Paul is saying is this. I want you to go to second mile. I want you to go to the extra mile when you're doing that, when you're helping someone through. You don't quit because you get tired. You help them until the burden has been lifted off them. 
Come on and say amen. And you keep working with them and working with them. And I know it can be tiring. And I know it can drag you over. Beloved, you do it. And you do it for Christ's sake. And then you do it for their sake. And God will take care of you in the end. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, you do it without ever quitting. A lot of people are quitters. Well, look around. We, we should have... If everybody came that's been led to the Lord and were faithful to this church, we'd have to build another church. Amen? That goes to share where people are because they don't know the, they don't know the Christianity is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And you've got to hang in and hang in and hang in. Amen? And you're fighting against the devil, fighting against the world, fighting against yourself. <laughs> okay? And so we do it without ever stopping or leaving anything, beloved. The question is, does this sound like you? Are you a burden bearer like this? Are you a servant like this? Are you a err like this, beloved? Or do you quit and bail out when the going gets a little too tough? Um, it's more than you kind of expected. Well, I didn't expect this. Good night. I thought I'd just go there, pick him up, drop him. And he wants me to go and do that, that, that. Well, beloved, if it has to be done and he can't do it, what do you think you should do? What do you think you should do? You have to do it. That's right. You go out of your way. So here, beloved, Israel could have lost the battle that day. They could have faced a humiliating genocide and defeat by the Amalekites if Aaron and Hur didn't see the need to rise to the occasion and lift up his hands, beloved, so they weren't defeated. Now, sadly, as then, so now. It's hard, and I mean it's hard, to find a self-motivated Ur in the church. Now, let me tell you what statisticians tell us, Christian statisticians. They tell us this, beloved. They tell us that 10%, less than 10% of the people in any given church, any given church, do 100% of the work that regularly needs to be done. Can you imagine that? Less than 10% of the people. A little gaggle of people amongst all the people. There's churches that have thousands of people and probably 100 will serve. Nobody else could be bothered with it. Oh, let me come in and have the air conditioner. Let me have the clean church. Let me have the communion table. Let me have the pastor that will preach to me. Let me have the pastor that will counsel me. Let me have all of that, but I ain't going to do anything. I'm not going to contribute. I'm going to be a sponge and suck it all up, and then I'll leave the same way as I came in. I hope that's not you, beloved. You know what that means, though, when 10, less than 10% of the people do it? That means that the doors of most churches only stay open because of the faithful few errs that are in the church who serve the church. Amen. Oh, hear me now, beloved. Listen to me. You can still find the Moses in the church. And you can still find the Aaron's and the Joshua's in the church. And you can still find the leaders in the church who are highly visible. And likewise, they perform a very important and invaluable job and service in the church. But the question is this, beloved, where are the errs who do the menial jobs? Where are the errs who serve anywhere they're needed? Where are the errs who step up to the plate and do the necessary work without ever being asked when they see a need arise in the church, beloved? Where are the errs that will minister to anyone, anytime, anywhere when they see the need? Where are they? There's few without expecting to be seen by others without expecting to be thanked or praised or exalted by others or noticed by others, beloved. So are you an err? You know, logistically speaking, the United States Armed Forces tell us that it takes 100 men working behind the scenes to keep just one Marine or one soldier fighting in the field. There's so much that has to be done. We focus on the guy with the machine gun, beloved, but where to get the bullets, where to get the, uh, the magazines, where to get the grenades, where to get the food, where to get the water, where to get all this. There's people working behind the scenes to ensure that that's one of the problems Russia's having right now. They have terrible logistics, how to get fuel to the tanks, how to get uh, food to their soldiers, how to get ammunition to their soldiers. But America's been in enough battles, we know how to do it, unfortunately. Amen. So what are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying this is what the errs do behind the church. You can find them. What are they doing? They're praying. Where's the errs? I'll tell you, he's right there. He's fasting. He's cleaning. He's serving. He's teaching. He's ministering. Where's the errs? He's doing all the various things that make it possible to keep the, the church doors open so the visible leaders, beloved, can do their job. You see, the errs in the church are both invaluable and they are indispensable. And they lift up the hands of the man of God and the frontline people 
who get tired and weary in the spiritual battle, and someone, beloved, who's dependable, they need to help them to step up so they can continue doing the work. I'll toot Brother Dave's horn. He's been my ur. Many times, I mean, I, Dave was scheduled to preach last week. I didn't make it because I had some real physical issues with my, myself. But Dave stepped up to the plate. And he stepped up to the plate many times over the years. He's been the ur. And we don't do it, beloved. For, we're not looking for thanks or praise or glory or all that. We're trying to do the Lord's work, but we can't do it without you. Everybody has to contribute. Would you say amen? You know, Ur was a very responsible person. He knew a lot of people counted on him. Can we count on you as an Ur? I hope we say amen, Pastor. You can count on me. I'll be there, hell or high water. I'll be there. I don't care what it takes. I'll be there. You can count on me. Well, if you're like that, beloved, then I want you to know that you're an Ur. Praise the Lord. Are you dependable? Are you a de- that dependable person? Are you that reliable person or indispensable and invaluable person, beloved? Can we say, you know what, Brother uh, Dave over here, Brother Derek over here, Brother Nick over there, they are the urs in the church. We thank God for them. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, that's point number one. People like Ur are always invaluable. Number two. People like Ur are always involved. They are always involved. Beloved, listen to me now. Do you get involved in the church to do its work, or do you just do your own thing on the side? Well, I want to tell you something. You're not ever going to get the blessing you would do if you did it for God's church. Amen? You do it for God's church. It's God's church. It's the church. When people lead people to the Lord and they want them to disciple and they want them baptized, they want them to take the Lord's hand, where do they bring them? They bring them to church. And when these people come in with all their baggage and all their problems, where do they drop it? They drop it right here. And who's the one that steps up the plate and counsels them? Not you. You leave it. Go see pastor. Or go see pastor so-and-so. Or go see pastor so-and-so. He'll take care of you. And then, beloved, at the end of the day, after you've preached two or three times and you've counseled for six or seven hours, you're totally wiped out, soaked with sweat. Adrenaline's gone through your body. And so what I'm saying to you is this here. Do you get involved? I want you to see what the Scripture has to say about this, beloved. People like her are always involved. Look what it says in verses 10 and 12. It says, So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Ur went up to the top of the hill. Drop down to verse 12. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him. Now, beloved, can you imagine that, that, trying to move a stone like that, which is relatively big size, is a lot of work in itself. And Aaron and Ur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, beloved, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. You know, Moses, Aaron, Joshua were all great men. They were great leaders. In fact, they were warriors in Israel, beloved, too. And they were highly visible. But Ur, well, beloved, he was an obscure figure. There's nothing in the scripture leading up to this man Ur. Look at him. He was kind of an obscure figure that just stepped out of nowhere. In other words, beloved, he was a common and ordinary man trying to help out wherever he was needed so that Israel could do extraordinary things. Because Israel knew we have the smaller army. But with God's help, we can do all things. Would you say amen? But we need an intercessor. We need a man of God. We need someone who can hold up the rod of God so God can supernaturally get involved. Ur said, I'm your huckleberry. I'll do it. I know they're not going to look at me. I know I'm going to go on notice. I don't give a rip about that. But I'll do it. Because this is for the cause. Come on and say amen out there. You see, beloved, later, the Bible tells us that Ur, in Israel, became a great, a man of great influence, and ultimately, beloved, he became a great leader in Israel because of his his, um, faithfulness. Now, I spent a lot of time trying to find out about Ur, okay? But there's not much in the scripture about him. A Hebrew tradition says that Ur was perhaps the husband of the prophetess Miriam, Moses' sister. Or, beloved, Ur was perhaps the son of Caleb, or he could have been the nephew of Moses. But you know what, beloved, as I sat down and I thought about it, 
it's not who he was that's important. It's what he did that's important. Amen? It's what he did for the cause, beloved. And I want you to notice here how involved and engaged he was in this fierce tactical battle and victory. He must have had a pretty good reputation, beloved, because Moses took him up into the mountain with him. He said, you know what? If I'm going to have anybody help me, Ur is somebody I can depend on. He's someone I can rely on. I'm taking him up. He may not look like much. People may not say much about him. He might not be too popular. But I know I can count on Ur. Come on and say amen out there. I know I can count on this man. Oh, beloved, that's what you want. Someone you can count on in an important mission like this. Amen. Oh, listen to me, beloved. Listen to me now. Not everyone can lead. Not everybody has been gifted with a, uh, with a, uh, from God to be a leader. And not everyone can pastor. And not everyone can preach or teach or sing. But everyone can and should help and serve God in some capacity in his church. Would you say amen out there? You see, folks, on this notable day, Ur did one thing. And he says, this is the one thing I can do. I can help this man. When he grows weary and weak, I'm going to hold up his hand and I'll tape it to my body if I have to so Israel can prevail over the Amalekites. Come on and say amen. You see, Moses is an aged leader now. Ur was kind of a younger man. He was younger than Aaron. You see, Ur did it willfully, beloved. Nobody had to twist his arm. Ur, Ur did it faithfully and actively in, in finality, beloved, until it was done. In other words, I'm saying he stuck with this job and saw it right from start to finish, beloved, just like God had called him to do. I, I don't say this on I say this humbly. I try, I hate mediocrity. I'm not a perfectionist. If a guy does everything wrong, but he's tried it with all his heart, I'm for that man. Because he's tried. You see what I'm saying, beloved? I, I see the motivation in his heart. I've tried. He's tried. But I can tell you this, beloved, I'm not a quitter unless something breaks down in my body. If God has called me to do something, I know he's going to equip me to do it. I want to do it for him. What do you say? It's the same thing for you. You do it. You stick with it. You, has there been good days? Yes. Has there been bad days? A lot of them. There's times I don't even know if I can walk, to be honest with you. Remember Dave and I, I told you one time, we were so winning up in Carver, it was pouring out like it is now. And the guy said, I live in this house in this dirt road, and there was a blanket hanging over the door. So I said to Dave, I said, I'll get out. I'll go, I'll go see if there's anybody behind me. I stepped out, walked in front of the car. And by the way, it was around Christmas time, and Dave had a, remember that, that reef you had on your head with all the lights? It's, <laughs> So I get out of the car, I walk in front of the car with a, a whoosh. I went down to my waist. There was a hole in the road filled with water. So I climbed out of it, go over to the blanket, open the blanket. It was an opium den. Hey, man, come on in. Everything's great, man. <laughs> right. And I said, only for you, God. I went out tonight for you, Lord. Maybe they had a reachable heart. Maybe they had a teachable heart. Maybe what I say, they will snap them out of that drug stupor that they were in. So you do it for the Lord. Amen. You become the Lord's Ur, and you do it. So Ur didn't quit. He didn't leave, beloved. He didn't resign because he got a little tired. He just wanted to quit. And a lot of people say, I don't feel like it anymore. You're a sorry person if you want to run your life by your emotions. You're a very sorry person if you run your life by your emotions. So he finished the job, beloved. You know, some jobs you do for the Lord get boring, but they're necessary work to do. You know, I, I, this has been a trying week for Ellie and I. Uh, I told you I, I, our, our, our dryer went, and then Thursday... From our sink to our septic tank, the piping went. So you can't even imagine the mess there was there, right? But when those guys showed up to help us, you know they were more important than the President of the United States to me? How about you? You take that plumber for granted sometimes, but he's doing an important work, isn't he? Something you can't do. Somebody that's Cleaning out your septic, uh, so to speak. If he doesn't do it, beloved, you well, you know it's going to back up into your tub, your sink. Uh, well, they're important people, amen? And I've got a heart. I've got a heart for people like that. 
People look down on them with their menial, doing menial jobs. They're doing some of the most important jobs in the world that nobody else wants to do. And you want to know what? It is God that has called them to it. There's no way that guy one day said, you know what, I think I'll be the man that cleans out the septic tank. That's what I want to do for my life. God rearranged his life to be able to do that, beloved, become a master plumber and know exactly what he's doing and helps a lot of people and worth every penny you pay. <laughs> I know, I've crawled underneath there. I've been in the, well, never mind. Worth every, I ought to give him my left arm. <laughs> You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. He stayed at his assigned post until he finished his assigned job. Is that you? Do you do that, beloved? Whether you're in a highly visible position in the church, whether you're in a non-visible position in the church, whether you're in a low profile in the church, beloved, God places us where we will be essentially needed to make sure that the body of Christ is able to function. Amen? What we don't want to be is a seat warmer. Pastor, I'm going to thrash you. You'll have to wait in line. I assure you of that. <laughs> you see, beloved, you don't want to be just a seat warmer. Amen. Remember, everything we do is co deo in his presence. Before the Lord, beloved, he sees it. And he'll reward us openly, not only in this life, but he'll certainly do it in eternity past. Would you say amen out there? You know, beloved, I'm sure Ur knew that this was a thankless job. Not too many people are going to notice him. And I want you to picture this. The battle's over. Here comes Moses and Aaron down the mountain. Moses probably hobbling on that stick. He's exhausted. Ur and uh, uh, Aaron on each side of him, kind of holding him up. And all the people, hey, Moses, hey, Aaron, God bless you, hallelujah, what a great job you did, praise the Lord. But if you looked off to the side, there's a solitary figure walking to himself, but he's content because he knows he did the Lord's work. And he knows that someday in the day of judgment, God is going to repay him whether or not anybody saw him. And the fact of the matter is probably only Moses and Aaron knew him, heard it. And yet, beloved, they would have never gotten a victory over the Amalekites if it wasn't for this Ur. Would you say amen out there? Nobody came up to him and said, hey, Ur, that was a job well done. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. No, he just walked by himself. It's a tough day. And he goes in content, not looking for any praise, not looking for any glory, not looking for any honor, adulation, acclaim, whatever it may be. He just did his job because you know, God was going to bless him someday. He just kept a low profile, beloved. Why? Because he knew someday, the scriptures has teach that someday in the day of judgment, publicly before the universe, imagine this, beloved, the angels, all the faithfully martyred and departed who are in heaven, someday God's going to point to that earth and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Inherit the kingdom that's been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Well done. You hear that, angels? You hear that, Gabriel? You hear that, Michael? You hear that, cherubims? Well done. Well done, her. Well done. And you've heard it from my lips to your ears. Well done. You see, beloved, they're going to be the ones that will receive the most rewards. And they're the ones that are going to receive the most crowns. And they're the ones that are going to receive the most acclaim. Now, beloved, I just ran out of time. Point number three is this. And I'm just going to give it to you quickly. People like her are always indomitable. They have an indomitable spirit. A spirit that doesn't quit. A spirit that knows exactly what it believes. Now, beloved, I want you to go to Exodus 24. Go to Exodus 24, verses 1 and 2. And the Bible says, And he, God, said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship afar off, worship here far off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. If anyone else went up, they would have been burned to a crisp in the sight of a holy God. 
Now I want you to drop down to verses 13 through 15. It says, And Moses rose up and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God, Mount Sinai. And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us. Now picture this, beloved. Look at me. Look at me. Don't look at your Bible. Look at me. Here's Moses getting ready to ascend the mountain. He says to the people, Tarry ye here at the base of the mountain. I'm going to the summit. You stay back here because I'm going to leave some leaders for you down here. I'm going to leave some people that I can trust to take care of my people down here. Now watch what he says. Let's go back to our text. Verse 14. And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us, and we, uh, 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 until we come again unto you, Moses had faith, I'll tell you, and behold, Aaron and her are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. Not just Aaron, but come unto who else? Er. Verse 15, And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. Now, beloved, leaders are people with strong moral and spiritual convictions, beloved. In other words, they're people who know exactly what they believe. They have their convictions screwed down tight. They can't be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine by the sight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby men lie in wait to deceive. So Earl was one of these type of people, and God knew it. God says, if I'm going to leave somebody in charge of my people, not only is it going to be the high priest, it's going to be this obscure, this unknown, this unrecognized person that held up Moses' hands, and his name is Earl, and you will obey him. See, God knew what kind of man Earl was. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, imagine, here's Moses and Aaron. Here's the 70 elders. Uh, there's the two sons of uh, Nadab and Abihu, who are the sons of, of, of Aaron. God says, I don't want them coming up in the mountain. Only you, Moses. You can bring Joshua, your servant, but he's got to stand afar off. So Moses goes up into the mountain. Let me give you the short version here, okay, so I can end this, this sermon, beloved. Moses is up in the mountain, and all of a sudden Joshua hears... There, there's this cry. So he hollers to Moses, Moses, there's war in the camp. There's war in the camp. And God tells Moses, that's not war. The people have made a golden calf. They're having a sexual orgy down there. You see, I haven't been down for 40 days, and they don't know what has happened to me. So they said, look at, let's make a golden calf. This is the God that brought us out of Israel. And here they are doing all of this, beloved. And listen to me, when you read in chapter 32, you don't, we're not going to go there, but if you want to read about it, read it there. God says to Moses, get out of my way. My anger wax hot. I'm going to annihilate all the children of Israel. And Moses fell on his face. Lord, please. These are the children of Abraham. These are the ones you made the covenants and the promises to. You can't do it. You can't do it. God says, I'll make a new nation out of you, Moses. Moses could have lived to 700 then, right? <laughs> make a new, a new nation out of him. He says, please, Lord, what are the people going to think of you? What are the heathen going to think of you? What are the Egyptians going to think of you? You brought us out here to destroy us? So Moses comes down the mountain, and he sees the people dancing. And he calls Aaron, his brother, the high priest. Aaron, what did you do? Well, it wasn't me. You see, they gave me this gold, their earrings, and I just threw it into the fire. And voila, this golden calf came out. Yeah, right. I got a bridge you can buy down the street, too. So Moses puts Aaron's feet right in the fire. But Ur, you don't hear anything about Ur, the other leader. You know why, beloved, I believe? Ur must have said this. This is sin. This is wrong before God. This is iniquity. This is indecency. This is immorality. Immortality. Immorality. This is indecent. This is wrong. I'm not going to do it. God doesn't want us to do it. I don't want to do it. You're not going to get me involved in it. So if you want to dance, go ahead and dance naked. That's what they were doing. You want to have a sexual orgy, go ahead and do it. But I'm not going to do it. I've got my convictions. I've got my standards. I've got my testimony. I'm going to keep my stand. I'm going to keep my stand. Having done all the Bible says stand. So Ur stands before the people and he rebukes them and he stands alone. Do you dare to stand alone? Oh, it's easy when you got people around you, isn't it? Do you dare to stand alone when everybody's trying to put your feet in the fire? You see, that's what Ur did. But listen to me, beloved. Years later, after this whole incident, 
God said to Moses, we need to make the furnishings for the tabernacle. We need to make the Ark of the Covenant. We need to make the, the, the uh, table of showbread. We need to make the, the uh, candelabras. We need to make all of these things. And I need someone who's going to be really gifted that I'm going to choose out that I am going to put my spirit on them and give them the supernatural skill to be able to do it. Well, beloved, Ur, we don't hear anything more about Ur. We don't know anything about him. He may have been martyred that day. They may have killed him for the stand that he took. We'll find out when we get to heaven. But I want to tell you something. I believe this, and I believe the scripture teaches this clearly. What we do as Christians not only affects us, but it affects our family and our children. They are going to learn from us. Amen? If I was a wishy-washy preacher, and a, uh, uh, instead of being a sin-hating, devil-stomping, pulpit pounding, window rattling, shingle pulling, blood bought, born again, if I was, but listen to me, my son would be like that, my daughter would be like that, the people around me would be like that, the church would be like that, amen? So what we do affects not only us, but it's a concentric circle that affects the people around us. And we all have a circle, a circle of influence, don't we? Now let's go to chapter 35, and I'll close with this. Exodus 35. Exodus chapter 35, we're going to read verses 1 through 5. And Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said unto them, These are the words which the Lord hath commanded that you should do unto them. Six days shalt thou be, uh, shall work be done, but on the seventh there shall be unto you a holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout the day for your habitations and upon the Sabbath day. And Moses spake unto the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord, whosoever is of willing heart, and let him bring it, unto, uh, bring it as an offering to the Lord, gold and silver. Now, beloved, back up just a little bit, chapter 34. In verse 1, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone, like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words which, uh, first tables, uh, which thou breakest. And then he goes on and he says, I won't read the rest of it. I'm just going to give you a little context. God says, I'm going to have all these furnishings for the tabernacle made, but we're going to put them in the most holy place where I will dwell, the Shekinah glory of God. The priest would go in on Yom Kippur one day, one day a year, that's the Day of Atonement, and all the God would come down and the Shekinah, you say Shekinah, but it's really the Hebrew word Shekinah. And it'd be a bubbling, boiling fire over the Ark of the Covenant. And it had two angels there. They were like this, facing one another. Okay, and the Shekinah glory of God was right between them, boiling and bubbling. And the high priest could only go in there one day a year because all the, the mercy seat, that was the mercy seat where the angels were on, but inside was the Ten Commandments, the law of God. It's in the heavenly sanctuary. God says to Moses, make a... Uh, 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 Ark of the Covenant like the pattern I showed you on the mount. The real one's in heaven, isn't it? Hebrews 8 and 10 will talk about that. But here's the issue that I'm getting at, beloved. When God looked for a craftsman to make the holy furnishings for the tabernacle, he personally chose, and he, he chose a man named Bezalel. Now, who in the world was Bezalel? Bezalel now listen to me, was the grandson of Ur. And he was also a holy, righteous, and godly man like his grandfather because he had studied his grandfather and learned from him and watched him. In other words, he watched his life. He watched his testimony. He watched his service. He saw his humility. So God says, I want Bezalel, the grandson of Ur, to do this. I'm going to anoint him. I'm going to put my spirit on him. I'm going to supernaturally gift him. You know why? Because of her. Amen? Because of him. Now listen to me now. I preached a sermon to you a couple years ago, I think. <laughs> it was called, what was it in David's? 
You always reminded me of it, Derek. Because, what was it? No, because of David. For David's sake. Again and again, the Bible says to the children of Israel, 400 years after David had died, I'm going to bless you for David's sake. David had been dead 400 years. But David was a faithful man of God, wasn't he? And God says, I'm going to bless you for David's sake. Even when they were in sin, God says, I'm still, I'm going, to ch- I'm going to chasten you, but I'm also going to bless you for David's sake. I'm going to keep a seed alive so the Messiah can come into the world and redeem humanity for David's sake. You see, beloved, are you an earth? God will bless you and your children and those who are around you when they see somebody they can look up to, that they can have respect toward. And we ought to praise people like that, ladies and gentlemen. Because they get very little recognition by anyone. Even a leader in the church gets very little recognition. If anybody gets attacked, it's a leader in the church, okay? But we ought to thank God for people like that that have a servant's heart that will become an earth. And they'll say, I don't care what it is, preacher. You need me, you call me anytime, day or night, I'll be there for you. And you know what I tell them? What have I told them? Have I done that for you folks? I don't say that boastfully, but I said that because that's the way I'm wired. We need to be loyal to one another. We don't have to agree on everything. <laughs> we can agree to disagree and love one another for Christ's sake, for David's sake. For earth's sake. Are you an earth? Are you an earth? Let's go to the throne of grace.